In this section, I show you various drawing tools and their applications. It is important to note that you do not need all of the supplies I include in these videos. I use materials such as vine and compressed charcoal, graphite pencil, and Conte to draw with. But if you only have a pencil, that'll work just fine. You can take the entire course with just a pencil if you'd like. But I do encourage you to try the materials that I'm using. I do explain the differences between these drawing tools and their uses. You will also learn about various erasing tools in this section, including chamois cloth and kneaded eraser. There are other tools to cover, such as the stump, which I use to unify value in a drawing, a ruler to use in perspective, and a mall stick to not smudge the drawing with your hand as you draw. You'll also learn different mark making, erasing, and sharpening techniques in this section, so let's get started. Um, in this lesson, let's take some time and let's talk about some supplies. Now, it's important to note when we're talking about supplies, um, you know, we can always read on the internet. And quite often I find misinformation. So I think the best thing to do is to call the company rep. If you really have a specific question to ask, they're more than happy um, to answer your questions about any products. But I'm going to sort of briefly talk about a few of these things. Um, so the first thing is let's talk a little bit about charcoal. And with charcoal, we have a couple of different types. And let's start off talking about vine charcoal. Um, vine charcoal is kind of um, what it sounds like. It is charcoal. It's actually um, burnt wood. And here we have several different sizes, several different types. So let's go through these. You can find these nice, big, thick blocks of charcoal. I enjoy using different brands of charcoal. Um, Windsor Newton makes a great charcoal. General, um, I'm kind of partial to a brand called Nitrum. One of the things I about, like about Nitrum is they do make larger blocks of charcoal like we see here. Um, which makes a wipeout method um, easier to do. So you have you know a nice big block, you have these you know big fat cylinders, and then we sort of get down into a smaller um, you know chunk of charcoal. And <clears throat> typically charcoal is round. Um, however, as you can see, some charcoal comes uh, as academic charcoal, and it's a square charcoal. So pick and choose what you would like to work with. Um, I like to work with all of these. Now, traditionally with vine charcoal, um, you can have different sizes. So if you see over here, you've got six millimeter. This is a four millimeter. This is a five millimeter. That has to do with the size. So this is like a four millimeter, and this is more like a six millimeter, so the thickness of it. And this charcoal is um, very light. It's easy to erase or wipe off or move. Now, this square charcoal, if you'll notice, it usually has a tag on it. So here we see H, right? it's in brown. And here we see B, and here we have an HB. So with this particular type of charcoal, this square charcoal, um, this academic charcoal, right, or a uh, Fusain charcoal, it comes in that square format. And it comes in the different hardness. Uh, an H is very hard. An HB is less hard. A B is getting softer and softer. So the B will make a darker mark. The HB typically a lighter and the H very light. Um, so with these types of charcoals, you have the H, the HB, and the B. H stands for hard, HB is less hard, and the B is you know, softer, and you can get you know, a 2B, and it goes on from there. Um, this makes a harder mark that isn't as dark. Of course, this one is softer, it is darker, and the B will be even darker. And if you have 2B darker, 4B darker, 6B darker. Um, and it depends on how hard you press as well, but if you're dealing with a drawing that has lighter values and you're still working on your hand control and pressure control, you will want to maneuver between different levels of hardness. 
Right. So when you work with charcoal, you'll notice that it gets used up fairly quickly. And before long, you'll be dealing with a lot of smaller pieces like this. It's also common for vine charcoal to break. And um, for the sake of being economical, um, a lot of companies make holders so that when your charcoal gets this small, um, you can put it in a holder. Um, this is a baton. It's designed to hold charcoal. This particular baton is designed to take this type of charcoal that's square. So it just slides down in here. And if it's a smaller piece, um, you can hold a little tiny piece like that. And this is also designed to have a long piece in it as well. And what this will do is it will pull you back from the drawing. And there's certain methods of drawing where this is really preferred. Now, they also make a very simple little um, handle. You can also use this to hold, you know, your charcoal in um, and draw with it, you know, when it gets small or if you want to hold it in there when it gets long. This is also designed um, to hold any kind of pencil, uh, charcoal or graphite um, for when the pencil gets quite small as well. Now, speaking of charcoal pencils, charcoal pencils are made up of compressed charcoal, right? So these are all compressed, and this is a white charcoal pencil. They do make white charcoal, and you'll also notice um, that these pencils, um, typically I like to use General. They make some nice pencils, but these are sort of basic pencils that you'd see, you know, that you grew up using. This is a little bit different. This is also a charcoal pencil, but it's a, a peel pencil. So you pull the string and you can peel off new charcoal when you need it instead of spending time to sharpen it. Now these charcoal pencils are compressed charcoal. Vine charcoal is softer. Compressed charcoal is when they take that same charcoal and they put a binder in it. And that binder, and they compress it. And that causes this charcoal to be a lot more dense, it's a lot darker, um, it's a lot richer, but it takes an awful lot of effort to erase this. Typically speaking, when you lay down some compressed charcoal, it's down there. So I usually use this in conjunction with the vine charcoal to create my darker darks, um, my deeper, richer darks, or to establish um, a nice tight line or detail, um, you know, to nuance the drawing. Now, the white doesn't come in various um, hardnesses, but just like this charcoal, these pencils will have a stamp on them. And it's right back there. So this is an HB, right? This is also an HB. Here's a 4B. So it says soft on it. Um, here's a 6B, extra soft. And here's a HB as well. So it's the same thing. Um, so it goes, you know, H, HB, you get into a B, 2B, you know, 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B. And the 6B is very, very soft. Um, the H's are, of course, harder. So that's compressed charcoal. Now, compressed charcoal. Um, also comes in sticks. And you can get very large, um, thick sticks of this type of charcoal, or you can get nice thinner sticks of compressed charcoal. Um, sometimes you can get like a big square, a little rectangle, but again, it's the same thing that's in the pencil. Dark, compressed, very dense, very rich, very dark, hard to erase. So it's just a different tool. They do make white charcoal. That is white charcoal, and that's a good product as well. And you can get that the same way you can get this. You can get it in thin little squares, you know, fatter rectangles, or you can get you know bigger chunks of this white charcoal. Now, while we're talking about this, there are other products. Like here, for example, um, this is a nice piece of just white chalk. Um, very similar to white pastel. I'll use that from time to time. This is very similar to the white charcoal, 
but this is actually white Conte. And this is very similar to our compressed charcoal, um, but it is black Conte. Now I can actually tell the difference, I don't know if you can, between these two, if they're sitting in a drawing box. So what is Conte? Well, it's very similar in nature, very dense, very compressed, but there is a waxy um, binder or material in here. So this is much more waxier in nature to the compressed charcoal. Um, this is also something that once you put it down, you can move it, smudge it, but it's fairly hard to erase. I will use any of these products together, but it's important to note that when I do use these products together, I typically lay a foundation with vine charcoal. Once I'm very comfortable, have my foundation and my drawing down solid, I'll kind of use the compressed charcoal and or Conte in some cases to come in and establish my darker darks to establish um, detail. To add on to our discussion of Conte um, and other materials, you know, this chalk um, or pastel that I showed you earlier, that just comes in so many different values, so many different colors. Um, that's great. But I also wanted you to understand that with Conte, um, you can also get different um, colors. They usually make um, a very nice you know, burnt umber or sort of sepia tone. Um, so those are also great to draw with as well. It's also nice to keep these materials um, sort of together and protected as an artist. So typically what I'll do is get a you know, container such as this. This is designed for fishing lures. And it sort of helps keep everything nice and organized. You know, charcoal does break. And particularly with these charcoal pencils, if you drop it on the ground, it'll actually break all the charcoal inside so when you're sharpening it the charcoal will fall out and become very frustrating um, so I find little things like a, a pouch to keep these things in and keep them protected is a great way to you know protect your tools um, same thing you can buy nice little zipper pouches and you can keep all your dusty charcoal in those and that will give it some protection um, you can also look at um, you know, other products very similar to the first one that I showed that just have multiple you know, places to keep um, different tools and to sort of tuck things in, um, thus giving you know, everything uh, you know, covered and uh, protected. So let's talk about graphite a little bit and using that. Um, you just can't beat graphite. Um, in fact, you, you could take this whole course and just use graphite. Um, graphite pencils you know, come in various different brands, different manufacturers. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a pencil. It just has graphite with it. And I prefer um, Tombow. Um, but general, I mean, they all make great pencils. I, I don't, um, you know, they're all good. But if we look at these, um, same thing with the charcoal. You know, there's a, you know, an, a 4H, a 3H, 2H, you know, B. Um, here's a 6B. Here's a 4B. Um, here's my 3B. I don't have a lot of H's in this particular pile. And they make an F as well. But it's the same thing. You know, an HB will sort of only get that dark. Now with pressure control, I can you know, make a nice gradient and I can get lighter and, and lighter and lighter. And this is all eye hand coordination, pressure coordination. But I can't get any darker than that. And I happen to be using a HB in this particular brand. So if I switch over and I have a 6B, and I sharpen my pencils the same way as we discussed with the charcoal, I will either use an actual traditional sharpener or I 
usually use my X-Acto knife and if I want to sharpen it again I'll go back to my block. I don't mix graphite and charcoal on the same block. It can be problematic. And we'll see that with the 6B it gets darker. So I can get that dark if you can see it with this 6B. Same thing, I can get lighter and lighter and I can use my pressure control and bring that out. Now let's take a look at Here's a 2H, okay? So that should be, this is gonna be quite hard. So let's take a look at that. So that is as dark as I can get that pencil. And I can lighten it up and bring that out. So there's sort of two different ways of working with these pencils. Honestly, I usually use an HB a B, a 2B, like a 3B, and a 6B. Um, I can get any kind of value range I want with those, but someone that's beginning, you sort of have two choices. You can keep going to the pencil that's going to give you that value, or you can sort of pick just a handful of pencils and use the concept of, you know, instead of saying, I need a dark value, I'm going to go with a 6B, now I need a lighter value, I'm going to go with a 4B, now I need a lighter value, I'm going to go to a you know, an HB or an H, and I'm going to press as hard as I can, and my values will be different. That's that's a great way to do it. Um, but another way is to pick a handful of pencils and use the white um, of the paper to go lighter um, or darker. Now you'll notice that this particular pencil has a much thicker graphite shaft that goes all the way through. These are great, a lot more graphite. Be wary of dropping it; it will break that graphite in there or a regular pencil with a thinner shaft of graphite. Now, these are all great tools. Six one way half a dozen the other. There's no real reason to pick one over the other. But this does have a larger you know, area or surface area so you can cover more you know, ground with a pencil like that. And very similar with charcoal, you can come in and lay down particularly with a fatter piece of graphite like this. And they do make graphite sticks and things of that nature, but you can lay down a tone. I can leave that tone. I can work on that tone with a finger. I can come into a tone with a stump and sort of unify this tone, or I can come in with something like this and unify. Typically with this, I will either not use it or I'll just hit it once on kind of a bass tone and I'll immediately, immediately come back over over that with a pencil and spend the time to work on it to make it a more unified tone. Um, I can tell when a drawing has been you know, strictly done with a stump and it looks very poor. Um, I can tell when a drawing has been just a stump has been used as a base coat and then the artist came in and spent the time to very carefully redefine the value and it just comes out looking um, a lot better. So those are, and those are some different things about pencils. Again, holding it and the way that you hold it, um, you know, choking back on it to midway, to a full range. Um, you know, those things are important. And instead of using a chamois or something like that, um, you can come right back into this and you can pull out a highlight with any sort of eraser. So the harder the eraser, the more that you can pull off that, but you want to be worried about you know digging into your paper. And then I don't use it a whole lot, but this works great too. If you've got very you know, tight detail that you want to pull out, like a highlight, you know, that works great. But so does a regular old pencil eraser. Right? Same thing bringing out a highlight. So that's just some basic information uh, about graphite and how to look at um, some concepts with using graphite and we'll see you in the next lesson. So in this lesson let's talk a little bit more about charcoal mark making and erasing. 
Now we took a look at vine charcoal earlier. So in vine charcoal, one thing I forgot to mention was you can get different levels of hardness, very similar to the pencil. We had the HB, the B, 2B, 6B, is you can get vine charcoal in hard, medium, soft, or extra soft. I typically work with medium, soft, and extra soft. So let's take a look at some of these products. So vine charcoal, very soft, and with a larger charcoal you can lay down very large masses, you know, very quickly. And always think, how can you hold the tool and how can you turn the tool, you know, to get the mark that you need. I can lay it down flat, put it on its edge, put it on its corner, all very different marks. But as you can see, you know, vine charcoal, no matter what stick I go to, is vine charcoal. Now this is a little bit harder, so it doesn't come off quite as soft. It's a little bit softer. But you can lay down large masses of tone with that. Now that compressed charcoal that we discussed earlier, you know, take a look at how dark that is. And it's very movable. You can create a um, you know, nice sort of gradation of shadow. Now this vine charcoal, that's movable too, see? But it picks up very easy. I can just bring my finger across and we already see white of the paper where this, very dense, very dark, right? A compressed charcoal. Same thing with the charcoal pencils. This is harder. This is a HB, I can tell. But I can, you know, put it on its side. I can, you know, bring the pencil up here, make multiple marks with it. Now this is a 6B. Okay, wow. So very close, very similar in nature to the darkness of that, but a much, much darker, richer pencil. Again, same thing, same product. Compressed charcoal, compressed charcoal. Now here's my Conte. It has more wax in it, but very, very similar in nature to our compressed charcoal. It's just a little bit more waxy. It's sort of same properties to a degree. The Conte is a little less movable because of the uh, binder in it, that wax in it, uh, than the compressed charcoal. And let's talk about um, holding some of these materials while we're at it. Holding it can help aid the mark that you're trying to make. So we grow up holding a pencil like this. When I'm holding a pencil like this, typically I'll put my finger on the page and I'm kind of letting this finger or these two fingers kind of ride and give me a point of contact and move around. So we sort of grow up, you know, writing in this method, um, drawing. I typically will do this when I'm more interested in a tighter drawing um, and I'm interested in detail and I've got the base of the drawing down. I also draw this way when I'm on a drawing table. But throughout this video, a lot of times you'll see me choke back. That's what we call it, choke back on the pencil. And the further I pull back, sort of the different marks I can make. Like right now I'm on my hand and I'm pivoting. I'm pivoting with this nice mark. You know, very good for cross hatching and whatnot. But you know, I'll, I'll pull back and I'll actually start holding the pencil like this. And that way I can use the side of the pencil. And I can also very quickly come up on its edge and back down. And a lot of times I'll choke way back on the pencil. This brings me away from the drawing. It lets me think more of um, angles. And it really helps with some of the techniques. I do the same thing with the vine charcoal. You know, in close detail, if I pull out and turn the chalk this way, I get a, you know, fatter line. I can make it into a thinner line. I can turn it. And you just heard it break as well. Um, a lot of times I'll do that. I'll break it if I need a smaller piece of charcoal. And maybe I just want to, you know, I need a mark that that's fat. And I'll break it again if I need, you know, a thinner mark. So that sort of goes over some different ways of thinking or holding a pencil. Now that we have all this tone down here, and I'll add some more.
we can start talking about erasing um, and um, you know pushing value around. So you can't beat um, using a hand. You know, if I, I pull out, there's sort of a half tone um, for creating a blend or pulling out a highlight. Now realize when I say that that your hand has oil on it. You're a human being. It, it has an oily surface. And you do need to be aware and be careful of that oil on your hand. It is not uncommon for somebody to say, don't touch the paper with your hand at all. And they have a great point, particularly when you get into a very detailed, long-term drawing with a very nice, expensive paper. When I get into that sort of situation, you know, I'll typically lay down a piece of paper um, a magazine is perfect because it has a glossy surface and I'll, I'll let my hand rest and I'll use that um, to keep my hand off of it. However, it isn't terrible to um, use your hand and you can also use a stick or a mall stick and you'll see me using that. Uh, I have an actual mall stick but grabbing anything will work. In this particular case we had a broom in the studio and if I'm drawing at my easel and I can put my hand on this and I'm off the surface and I can very comfortably rest my hand and relax and work on you know, my mark making or what I need to do and I can just slide this around and hit anywhere in the drawing. So that's another great way. But at the end of the day, some of us like to be more tactile. It's fine to use your hand. Um, I usually make sure it's clean of oil and pretty quickly you'll notice that if you do use your hand it builds up a layer of charcoal and kind of protects between the paper and your hand. But be aware a lot of people don't like to use their hand for the reason of oil. Let's take a look at a few more things. We talk about chamois. They're synthetic and natural. I always suggest a full natural chamois. You can get these at any art store. You can get them online. You can also find them if you're on budget in an auto parts store. And they usually are a lot bigger and you can cut them up into smaller squares. But this will pull out a nice, you know, half tone. I can use this and I can turn it and I can shape it into a, you know, finer point. Um, or I can, you know, fold it up and kind of use it as a texture and dab out if I'm working on a landscape maybe. Or I can just simply fold it up and, you know, create the width or length that I need and pull out massive tones. Students always ask me, well, how do you wash these? Well, you don't. Um, particularly with a non-synthetic, it will get dry and all wrinkly and kind of weird. The best way to clean these is just take them and just slap them on your hand or against your easel and the dust will sort of fall out of it. And you should expect it to look kind of like this after some heavy use. I mean, there'll become a time when you can retire it um, and get another piece. But you slap it against an easel or something of that nature, the dust will fall out and you can use these typically for years. Right? So my next favorite tool is going to be an eraser. They typically come in squares. This one's been cut in half. They're usually a full square. A neat eraser is important. Um, I will say there's a lot of brands out there that are not very good. I use a brand that's by General. Some of the cheaper brands just don't work and they feel kind of like gum. But you pull this out of your wrapper and it comes in a square and then you can kind of start kneading it to the shape that you want. If you need detail for an eye or hair, um, you can shape it and you can pull out a mark. You can make it fatter. You can make it really big. You know, and you can dab it. Now after time, this will get really dark um, and dirty. So here's an example. Here's the cool thing about this. It cleans itself. So watch this. See how dirty it is? You just take it and you start to pull it apart. That's why it's called a kneaded eraser. I'm kneading it. I'm kneading it into a shape to erase and I'm kneading it to clean it. So you just keep pulling it apart like that. And 
you see how clean it's getting? So you don't need a new one when it gets dirty. You just need to do this. And when you need a little tiny eraser, you, know, you can just pull off from the big chunk and you can make these nice little erasers and then put it back into the big chunk and save it. But let's get this clean. There. I mean, that's pretty clean. So you can clean those up and it'll erase better when it's cleaner. And then you just keep kneading it for that nice clean uh, eraser. And it'll pick right up. All right, so kneaded eraser. And I'm not going to go into every eraser that I have here. And you certainly don't need all of these. You need to realize I'm pulling out of a professional box of drawing tools that I've built up over 30 years of drawing. So this alone will do you just fine. You don't need an additional eraser. However, um, as a professional artist, I do have several different options. And all I can say to you is to sort of go through your local store and kind of pick and choose what you want. Um, but these pearl erasers that are your basic school eraser, you can get a real nice point off of those. Nice sharp point. You have softer erasers. Um, and then you'll have like a harder eraser where this is actually for ink and pencil. But if I'm working on a sturdier piece of paper and I want a much crisper line, that can get me there. You have pencils that have erasers on them where very similar to a charcoal pencil is this will make a mark and I can actually even come in and I can shape you know my eraser to a very fine point if I need the detail. I was doing hair or grass perhaps and then I have the fat point. I'll do something like that. And all these erasers come in different variations of how hard it is. And um, if I'm working on a really hard paper in compressed charcoal I'll have to sort of switch to a very hard eraser and even though compressed charcoal is known not to pull off, if I have a very, very hard eraser, I can actually start pulling it off. Where a softer one, not so much. Um, so all I can say is just recommend working with these different erasers. See, this has a much different feel. It's very soft. This is a very, very hard eraser. I can get a hard edge. I can keep a hard edge on it, put it on its side. I can put it flat and erase out what I need. You can get these pencils and either you know, a very fat form of eraser um, or very thin. Again, this can create a nice line. Or you can turn it, roll it over on its edge and push down and create a you know, fatter line. And later on in this series, you'll see me actually use an electric pencil in my portrait work. Um, completely unnecessary, but it helps get things done quickly. Is Same thing, you can erase out very fine detail. It digs into the paper a little bit more and I can actually come into an area where I have compressed charcoal and actually just like the harder eraser because it's electric actually start to pull out um, a light where other other erasers just won't pull that charcoal out. Now notice when you're working with something like an electric eraser or a much harder um, eraser or particularly this pencil eraser is very very hard eraser is it will pull out where you want light but if you're working on a cheaper thinner piece of paper such as I am here it will go right through the paper and just dig through it so I don't recommend using an electric eraser or one of these harder erasers unless you have a thick very nice you know, high quality paper because it will dig through it. Now while we're taking a look at all this not only can I use my hand to create that tone like we talked about um, our chamois but there is a variety of different items we can use to we could say you know push around this charcoal. Um, so this is just a a spongy-like material that you can come in and use to blend 
use to pick up and to push around um, some of your charcoal. And these are all the same thing. It has various um, edges to either pull charcoal out or simply push it around and move it. Same tool, different tip, gives you a different feel. Same tool, just much softer. Uh, you know, to push that charcoal around and make a gradation. These are all stumps. You can get these in various sizes. And they do the same thing. You're just simply pushing tone around, usually to unify it. Um, you use it to blend. There are different thoughts behind these materials. I find that you don't need them, and a lot of artists don't use them, um, but I think they can come in handy. The argument when someone is using this or not using it is I think a lot of younger students think that this is the key and that all they have to do is just come in and blend everything and it leads to a very poor looking drawing. This is kind of a tool that you use sparingly in certain locations. I mean it's rare that I, I will blend but then I will come in right over that with a piece of charcoal and kind of reestablish with a drawing. So I hear this a lot and I think it's a great point is you're using this as sort of a base coat of blending and then you're quickly getting away from it and you're reestablishing that um, gradation or that blending with a um, actual tool or actual charcoal. So I guess you can sort of think of this maybe as um, maybe an underlayer or an undercoat. Maybe not the best analogy, but maybe like primer and this is the actual paint. I think a younger student or beginning student can sometimes get too carried away with these stumps because they feel like they're getting a good blending technique and they take it too far and the drawing um, starts to fall apart. So be cautious with these, but they're still a good tool. And it isn't uncommon for me to use a paintbrush. Uh, a paintbrush is also a great tool for pulling around charcoal. You know, that just made everything a little bit lighter. It made it more unified. So it is quite often that I'll actually use a paintbrush in several situations. And as the artist, you will see people use different techniques with all these things. Study that, pick up on it, but also you yourself will develop different approaches and ways of using these materials. So I can't stress enough how Look at how other professionals use them, copy that, mirror that, but then also explore on your own and come up with techniques and ways of working that um, appeal to you, your eye-hand coordination and the way that your brain works. But I think this is a great start. And don't get too frustrated with everything I'm showing you here. Um, again, you can take these materials down to just bare bones basic, find charcoal, chamois, eraser, done. Um, but I thought it was important to show you everything you could do. And as a professional artist, I have a lot of tools that I've built up. And I don't want a beginning student to feel like they have to go out and buy these tools. It's not the tools that make the great drawing. It's the artist, the eye, um, and the hand, and how that artist uses it, as well as that knowledge that you have. Um, of different things such as value or form and so on. So I think this gives us a very strong overview of not only some of the basics but getting into upper level materials and working with them and some different ways to think about them. So use this, practice, and I'll see you in the next lesson. So let's talk a little bit about sharpening you know, some of these tools and how we can approach sharpening them. Now as you work with particularly vine charcoal, um, you can create an edge as you're drawing on the surface. This charcoal goes rather quickly and you, know, you can create a nice point. Now 
Another thing you can use is a sanding block. This is a sanding block. It's a student grade sanding block. I usually use a very large piece of sandpaper in a Tupperware container that captures all the dust. But people like to use this different ways. Now you can come in like this with an edge and you can essentially start making a point like you're familiar with, you know, like a pencil. I do that. It does waste a heck of a lot of charcoal, but there's times when I want the point. But when you really want to think about sharpening charcoal, I really recommend this way. It uses less charcoal, so you keep your product longer, and it makes less waste, you know, less dust. But if you bring this charcoal straight down on the sanding block, like so, every single piece of this entire round edge will be sharp. Um, and that, so that gives you quite a bit of surface. So I will draw with this, it gets very sharp, and then just comes straight down. That'll keep me from just running through an entire piece of charcoal and creating all this dust. Now, let's talk about the dust. Um, the dust is usable. Like I said, I'll use a big piece of sandpaper in a container, and over a period of weeks or months, I will collect a lot of this charcoal dust. You can use this dust the same way that you use the charcoal. Um, you can you know, brush it on with a brush or your finger and, and you know, create a very nice um, surface. I don't recommend using any kind of pencil sharpener for vine charcoal. Right now when it comes to compressed charcoal pencils, there's a couple of different ways to look at that. When you have used up a complete block, this one really isn't used just because it's dark doesn't mean it's used, but you can come in and literally you know, just keep turning your pencil and I kind of go in a circular motion like this at an angle and I'll try to bring that point out. If your sandpaper is used, just rip it out or fold it over. And again, I'm going in a circular motion. I'm putting the pencil at an angle and I'm rotating the pencil at the same time, but I'm doing it quicker. That's a great way to sharpen your pencil. It gives you um, a nice point. Any sort of sharpener, you can go through and sharpen it just like a pencil. When I was in school, I was taught not to use these. I um, mean, I think it's somewhat of a valid point, meaning this is so soft, a lot of times it'll just end up breaking it and breaking it and breaking it, and you kind of come up with this sort of mechanical edge. But I don't have a problem using a pencil sharpener like that. I'm, I do, it's easy. But in traditional you know, drawing, it's typical that you use a knife or an X-Acto knife to sharpen your pencil. So as you can see, these are sharpened that way. Um, in fact, we weren't allowed to use a sharpener like this in our art classes. And I think the reason for this is you get a much more controlled point and you can really pull back if you want to and create a long point. You can make a short, dull point. Um, you know, and I can, I can come in and I can, I can chop a point and make it a fatter point. So I feel like you have more control over the type of point that you have. And I recommend that my students also sharpen their pencils this way. But I'll hold the pencil and I'm pushing back with this hand and forward with this thumb. So this hand is putting pressure against the thumb so that I'm just not going off like really fast. So I'm sort of controlling. This is pushing that way. This is pushing the other way so that it has control. And I'll just lock it in. And again, I'll push with my thumb, but control it by pushing back. And I'll just rotate the pencil. And I can make a short, fat, stocky point, or I can make a nice, you know, thin, more detailed point. And at this point, we have this thick um, edge on it. I can sort of sit here and, um, you know, carve that down like so, um, and I'm ready to draw. Or I can bring it back over to the sanding pad and again with that same motion, make a much, much, much sharper uh, point. And it 
gives me more control. So I just sharpen that like a big fat kind of screwdriver point, right? which is great to draw with. But I can sharpen it down to this point. But it gives us more, um, I guess, latitude, so to speak, on the kind of point we're using. And with this knife, you, know, you can really come in and shape a piece of charcoal, um, fat, narrow, medium, super thin. You can even cut a little V in it and kind of make two little points if you're very careful and you have a soft piece of charcoal. So it's more universal using it this way, but it is harder. So those are some ideas and thoughts behind sharpening your tools, and we'll see you in the next lesson. So while we're discussing some of these things, let's take a minute and let's talk about paper. You'll notice I'm using newsprint. Um, it's a great material, um, but this material is a rough newsprint, meaning it has these little tiny teeth, um, or sort of you know micro texture. That texture grabs the charcoal, or whatever medium you're using, and helps pull it off and stick to the page. They also make smooth newsprint. It's the same thing, but it's a much smoother paper. So if I'm using something that um, I want um, a large tone on, I'll typically use a rougher or textured paper. If I'm you know, using something maybe it's more linear in nature, I might move to that smooth paper. Um, but I really recommend that you try out different papers. There's bristles, there's rag, there's cotton rag, there's plates. Um, there's so many different materials that you really have to sort of delve in and use them to figure out how you like them and how you can utilize them. There's certain papers that work for certain people that, for whatever reason, I just don't care for them, and vice versa. But, as a student or someone that's learning, I think the best thing you can do is actually call the company that makes the paper. They will send you for free a sample pack. So I called Canson. I said, hey, I want to know more about your papers. And they said, of course, we'll send you a nice sample pack and you can test them all out. And really, when reading this material, you know, the manufacturer will sort of tell you, hey, this paper's best for these kind of things. And see, this is a thick, thick, thick paper. Um, this is cotton and it's got a great texture to it. Right? And they sort of show you examples of what things will look like. And some of these papers up here are more plate oriented. Um, they're, they're a thinner you know, paper. And um, they'll come in different tones. Some of these are more of a, the camera may not pick it up, but this is more of a cream color. Um, and they give you a description of the paper, the weight of the paper, the thickness. And that, in my opinion, is a better way to learn about papers. Um, here's Arches, and they make all these nice papers. Um, these are actually printing papers, but they're great to draw on. But look, they have the gray, a tan, a cream, and they get into these different thicknesses, different textures, different colors. But they sent me that for free. Right, same thing with these. What kind of paper do we have? What's the weight on it? And you can just test all these out. These are thicker um, boards, but same thing. Arches sent me this. And that's how I recommend learning about your papers. Now, I'll give you a list um, that discusses some of the papers that I like particularly. I mean, every artist has their favorite. But make a phone call, get some samples, work with some different papers, keep a notebook, kind of make a list. Hey, these are my favorite papers for doing these specific techniques.